And today we have someone who I'm very excited to be talking with. To many of you, he needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, he is the man, the myth, the legend, Derek <laughs> Lambert. And Derek, could I ask you to also introduce us today? Absolutely. We are Myth Vision and Harmonic Atheist. Welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate awesome. it, brother. That was awesome. Thank you. I love how you do that. Yeah, man. It's just a little thing that, uh, you know, gradually evolves like everything. <laughs> and uh, it, it's become a thing where everyone who watches knows that I'm truly on a journey. This is not a joke. I'm not just doing this for clicks. It's like I really am figuring things out the best I know how. And it's a vision. It's, it's a journey. It's, it's myth vision, you know, so. It is. Well, um, for anyone who doesn't know you, um, who sh they should, and uh, hopefully the, the word will get out a lot, a lot more than it is even today. But Derek is the uh, person who runs an amazing uh, site called Myth Vision, uh, the YouTube channel Myth Vision. And could you, I could tell you my experience and I'll, I'll, I wanted to give a little bit of background on it from what, from what I've gleaned from it. But could you just tell me in your words, what is Myth Vision all about? If you had to describe to somebody who'd never heard of it before, what is your purpose and dynamic? Myth Vision is, is a bunch of things. It's dynamic. It, it, it's got uh, many layers to it, but ultimately it's a place where you can explore ideas freely without the judgment coming from Christianity and from the consensus of serious scholars. So uh, you got the, well, that's a fringe idea. Now, don't get me wrong. Even I think some things are too fringe. I just don't touch them. And that's because it's subjective. This is my show, right? It's so it's, it's something I'm not going to touch. I'm not personally interested in doing a show on blues and grays, aliens and stuff, or greens and gray aliens. Okay. That's just not my thing. Could they exist? Sure. I don't know. I've never experienced that. I don't see. However, it's an area that I think needs to be touched because some of these fringe ideas I think are borderline possibly uh, true, possibly. Yeah. And they're avoided or they're not uh, dealt with, I think, uh, thoroughly in many ways. So, but then again, uh, some, some people think they have dealt with them and I think it depends on methodology. So anyway, myth vision is really about a man who came from fundamentalist Christian, hardcore, speaking in tongues, having, you know, visions, uh, in a sense, while worshiping God in church, closing his eyes, approaching the throne of Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God, and, and, and feeling an ecstatic feeling, you know, everything was emotion and experience, and from someone who really felt like a sincere passion for the Lord Jesus Christ, and worshiped and loved God and his word, to someone who says, Wow. Like, it's like a magic trick. All of that, I peeped behind this, um, this little uh, curtain and I saw the trick. And when I saw the trick, which is the mythology, the literacy, the, the building blocks for something that a human created rather than the divine, that's when I started going, oh my, oh my gosh, there's a human aspect to this that outweighs any top, in my opinion, any potential real Holy Spirit, in, inerrant, infallible word of God for the Bible. And then I said, well, hold on, let me figure this out more. And the more I studied the Bible critically, like not trying to make it false, not trying to go out like, a, hey, hey, God, so let me prove it wrong like everyone, like a Christian would think that I would think. No, I went into it trying to explore possibilities like trying to explain something like why two bears would kill 42 kids because they called elijah bald i mean if you really believe that god would kill 42 children because they yelled bald head to a prophet named elijah your god is horrible i mean you have a absolutely evil cruel god and with that being said i started to go is this astro theology is this a celestial mythology type of motif where the two bears might be Ursa Major, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor in the heavens and some type of poetic uh, heavenly imagery is taking place here. And so it's been anthropomorphized or something to that extent, not sure. That destroys certain fundamentalist teachings that I once had. And so I started going into the path of allegory, metaphor, is this symbolism, you know, like different dynamics to view the New Testament or Old Testament scriptures 
at. And once you do that with Jonah and you say, well, there wasn't a real fish swallowed by a giant or giant fish swallowed a man or a whale, as most people understand it as, um, you start to go, he survived it three days in the, in the depths of the sea. And then the New Testament uses this to say that's what Jesus did in the heart of the earth. And I said, ooh, if we're willing to neglect Jonah, what's this do with Christ? And so you got to ask those questions, and it's a, it's a treacherous ground. So anyway, man, that's myth vision for you in a, like a tiny bit. Yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's from my my side it's it's been a great experience because it it was i mean just to put it at the most best level it was kind of what i needed because i when i escaped uh, about a year ago i could see some of that stuff and i had never put the pieces together the dominoes had never fallen before it and from what i can uh re remember just it, nothing had ever explained it that way at all i, I knew there was right. some slight pagan parallels but you know from the apologetics perspective there's nothing really to those are they're fluff and all of a sudden i was like whoa this stuff isn't just real and it's not just fluff this is probably where it came from and once you taste it you're like i'll bet there's a whole lot more than i know there's so much more than i'm aware of and i'm like i'm looking for stuff and i came across your channel and i i forget how i how i did but I'm glad I did. I, I know I did pretty early on in the process um, once I deconverted and it was like exactly what I needed. It's like, I know there's more to it. And I started looking at your stuff and the people you're interviewing. I'm like, there it is. And it's, it's not just like, like fringe theories. Like, like this is, this is stuff that it doesn't make sense unless it's somehow in one of these paradigms, like the whole right. Elisha and the bear thing, like that doesn't make sense. But once you start talking about the baldness and the sun and, and the Samson and his hair, you're like, ah, this is his sun god thing again. Yeah. And you start to put the pieces together and then you, and then it's just like, wait, it's, it's not just like one or two little one-off stories. You're talking about, you know, you know, the crucified between two thieves and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but just, it's like, whoa, this thing is all over the place. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes what I find with those interpretations is one may not, you know, you might find equally competing uh, interpretations and not sure which one has to necessarily be the source for which they drew from. I mean, I, I had this recent conversation with Dr. Price in person just the other day, and he was interpreting where was he at? I can't remember exactly where the where the interpretation was coming from in the particulars, but uh, I was like, could that be? Or maybe it was the Samaritan woman. I'm not sure. All I know is that the woman at the well, yeah, the woman at the well with Jesus, which was the Samaritan woman, um, he started talking about how there were sources, and he was outside of the biblical narrative here. It was a, a Buddhist source where um, one of the women that Buddha bumps into in his journey at a well says um, something like, well, master, you are of a different caste than me. I am not allowed to give you water. And he goes, this, I am almost positive. Dr. Price said, this is where the source comes from. And I just, you know, my head explodes and I have to put it back together before I can even respond. Um, awesome. And I said, well, there's also narratives in the Hebrew scriptures where, you know, guy walks up to the well, he's thirsty, uh, but he finds the woman he loves, so to speak. And here you have, you know, um, Isaac or is it Jacob, Jacob, and Jacob finds the woman he loves. Of course, he gets screwed over seven years in and sleeps with his sister and ends up marrying both of them. But anywho, none of that matters. Uh, and the point I'm making, I guess, is that he, there's a woman he loves at the well. And I think there could be a hint at the Samaritan woman here, possibly, by saying, yeah. I know you've had different husbands, but I'm going to be the one who loves you. You know, I'm going to love you, even if you don't love yourself. Kind of like Hosea, the prophet, go marry a prostitute. Well, who is the Samaritan woman but a prostitute? I mean, you've been with five husbands and the one you're with right now is not. So you, you start to see a picture. Anyway, um, I was going to say on the Jonah thing real quick. I just jumped to that conclusion while describing myth vision. There's a reason why you don't take that account literal history in the literal sense. Like you said, Tim, you said it well. Uh, there are pagan parallel or motifs, even if you want to say in the ancient Near East, where these things take place. But there's also celestial concepts that you can consider and go, well, is the well a giant fish in the sky? Did they have a 
astrological symbol for a fish in the heavens. And so when you do think, oh, okay, they did, is there a giant boat in which Jonah decides to ride away from God on the maybe ark that's in the heavens, uh, like the Argonauts? And so, you know, you start to go, holy moly, there's a bigger picture. And for me, synchronistic concepts or parallels beyond the Bible are what expanded my, my consciousness, my thinking to a point where I started to go, wow, it took away the uniqueness of this one canon of Bible that was the truth. And it said, at first for me, the deconstruction took place. I said, uh, or deconversion, deconstruction, same thing for me was it's bigger. So God's bigger. And that's what I did. I said, God's bigger than just the Bible. That was a safe slow evolution out for me to start to go to a point where I was safely able to ask the questions to go, is there really a God or is God an anthropomorphic imagination or a God of the gaps figure for man's misunderstanding things or not understanding things? And therefore you start to go, Hmm, the volcano wasn't Yahweh or Yahweh's doing the earthquake was not Yahweh's doing the, the you, you go into the sun rising is not Yahweh's doing and you start to get into these uh scientific things that we have today that we did not have then so yeah it is it and the the really amazing thing about all this is and I, I know you, I've heard some of your stories so I know you would agree with this but when you're coming from a biblical background where you're getting the training um and I want to hear more about your your backstory uh in, in a minute here but just, you know, I come from a similar background. And when you, you you get all this stuff, you know, Bible, 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 left and right, in every which way, not just in terms of theological dogma, but just the, the general devotional stuff, read your, you know, read your devotional books, you listen to sermons, um, you know, memorizing scripture. It's like, it's, it's, it's just pushed down your throat and you, you want it. You, and you want the word. It's, it's your, it's your, it's your lifeblood, uh, mm-hmm. your lifeline. And, and yet in the midst of all that, one of the things that stood out to me so strongly is they must have said a million times, uh, get the context. Like what's the therefore, therefore, what, what's the context? What's happening behind the scenes? And so many sermons I remember where you would hear the pastor bring in something really clever that like, Oh, that really helps elucidate the, the context. And now from this side, I'm like, you all don't even understand what context means. Like you you didn't even start to give the context. I mean, you, you cannot understand a New Testament person's perspective unless you are just neck deep in understanding their cosmology, their angelology, their educational background. You have to understand, you know, the, the Greek gods and the Roman gods and, and, and a few other cu- cultures. You have to understand the, the Greek education, you know, the, the Plato, the Homer, all that stuff. If you don't have it in your mind, you cannot read this Bible in context. You can't. Yeah. And it's like, it blows yeah. my mind that that stuff wasn't even, it wasn't even like a, well, we'll, we'll tack it on to the end of our course. Like it's not there. It's just. No. What do they, what do they tell us, Tim? The Bible interprets the Bible. And, and here's yes. the problem. You can't. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Eh, put it on the screen. Wrong. You, I, I get what they're saying. And to some extent that might work, but how can you know that the Bible interprets the Bible unless you know that, for example, eschatological concepts or uh, heaven and hell concepts are borrowed from Zoroastrianism. And when you look at Zoroastrianism in the Greco-Roman world, where the Greeks also had an afterlife uh, similar, if you will, in some respects that evolves as well. You, how do you know? Like when you're reading the Old Testament, you see the evolution of a prior thought develop into something new using the bible to interpret the bible you're gonna this is what happens in fundamentalism which i want to write a dissertation at some point when i go to get my phd on on really the issues with fundamentalism and fundamentalist interpretation and methodology because the movement that i came out of last was called full preterism and we'll get into that but it's the teaching that jesus christ actually did come back in the first century because God forbid, he said he would. And if he didn't, well, he's a liar. There he's a false prophet. It loses everything. And all Christianity stands on what? Nothing. So you kind of have to run to that at the end if you're really being honest with time statements and realize Jesus said it. Did he do it? Well, you can't lie. Therefore, he did it. And so there's this fundamentalist approach that goes to Revelation and says, all right, there's the new heavens, the new earth, all these things. And Jesus said that he was coming back soon. The end was supposed to happen soon. They all are anticipating something coming up. 
therefore it must have. And therefore, since it did, and it didn't literally end all human history, literally destroy planet Earth, literally restart a new heavens and Earth, um, it must be covenant language or allegorical language or language that was symbolic of something else, spiritual language. And so what they do is they run to the end, they see that it happened, and they have to now understand, let's go back on the beginning and reinterpret Genesis and say Genesis meant what Revelation's talking about. So now you have a Adam's death is allegorical, not literal, physical, even though later on he dies, but he didn't die the same day as God said, if you eat thereof, you will truly die this day, right? Well, he didn't die that day. So they have to redefine things. And now they're using the Bible to interpret the Bible and you run into problems. You start running into all these issues. And so I get into the theology. I know a lot of atheists couldn't care less. They just run from it and they go, oh, I'm done with the book. Why do you waste your time? I'm interested in it. I think it's interesting hearing why different people believe. I'm going to have a Mormon uh, scholar, not not a believer in Mormonism, but a guy who knows the history, who knows Mormon, uh, how Joseph Smith was a criminal and uh, going into a lot of different things. I mean, why do you care about that, right? Well, it's interesting, I think, especially once you hear that they were trying to start a war in, in their state and trying to make Mormonism take over. Uh, so you'd start to find out some crazy oh. stuff historically, but yeah. I will anyway. admit my ignorance on, on some of the other uh, versions of Christianity, but that, that is awesome. I mean, it, what you're doing, what you've been doing for fundamentalist Christianity um, and just for basic evangelical Christianity, even if people didn't call themselves fundamentalists, like people need this information and it's beyond. And I think David Fitzgerald has done a little bit of that too, if I'm not mistaken with some of his books and it is, it's so oh. critical. People just, they just need the information. We're not, um, you know, people can still believe if they want to, it's their choice, but obviously, but I think from my perspective, my biggest, if, if I was to look back and say, well, what was the, what was the biggest beef you had with what happened with you being in Christianity? My biggest issue is they just didn't tell me almost anything that's really critical to, to making this decision. It comes down in a sense to doing street epistemology on yourself. Like, how do you really know that you know that that's true? Like you, all those questions and I know, you know, you know, all those questions I'm thinking of, but it's like you have Pine to. Creek does that real well. Yeah. He, he talks about this stuff a lot. I personally don't take that route with my channel. Um, I think there's plenty of channels that are atheist channels that, that do uh, talk about this stuff. I'm sure you'll be talking about a lot of this stuff as well. I think it's important that it's discussed. I just personally am more fascinated with digging into letting you peep behind the curtain. I think that's a soft approach to make you go, hold on, is, did he even exist? Or is this an allegory? I mean, like you start to make those questions. Some people need to get in your face like Arn Ra. Others like me are more like, hey man, grab my hand. It's going to be okay. Let's go across this, this bridge together. You know, it's gentle. Yep. Uh, some people need to go, are you that dumb? You know? So, I mean, Joel yeah. Pearson was, you know, we're chatting the other day and um, on a previous video and he, he said something similar. He was kind of real in the end because I was talking about, you know, street epistemology concepts and um, things like that and, and trying to make a difference. And he's, he said something and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but something to the effect of like, you're, you got to realize this isn't a logical issue like you're not going to escape based on logic you should be able to maybe but you're not going to people aren't going yeah. to say yeah that makes sense so i'll leave christianity They're, that's not good that's not the way the conversation is going to go and it was a good reminder i i think i i'm very challenged in my questioning myself like obviously you know when you escape uh what i call the bible prison when you escape the bible prison you do go back to yourself and psychoanalyze yourself and say what what was i thinking what 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 let me think this was okay? Yes. Like what mine was more focused on the genocide stuff, the slavery, um, the uh, misogyny, the, the, uh, you know, the child brides or whatever child kidnapping, whatever you call it for the young girls, all that stuff. That was m more my, my issue. Like, why didn't that, why didn't that concern me? Why didn't Noah's flood like give me angst? And I think part of it is because you get exposed to it so young, but that was my, my issue. Like, why doesn't it, why did it make more of a difference? But I, I, do question, going back to, to Joel's comment, I question the, the what if, like what if someone had just said, hey, Tim, I would like to 
you know, I'm a skeptic, I'm an atheist, whatever. I would like to yeah. put some things out on the table for you. It, you know, in the midst of your, your studying to be a pastor, you're in the word, you know, every minute of the day. Let me put some facts out there for you. Would I have deconverted then? I mean, you never know, but would I have just walked away and said, oh, that's, that's garbage. Either I can explain it as garbage or I know somebody, some apologist can say, that doesn't make sense. There's, there's, there's something else to this story that you're not telling me or you're, dece- you're just flat out, uh, flat out deceiving me. There's no way that this is true. Therefore, you're not a threat to my Christianity. I don't know. I, I wish I knew the answer, but I'm, I'm curious if there's some personalities where it would. Like if you could just, if you could present certain information in a way that they could say, I understand and I know how to do my research to verify that. If that, if certain bits of information would basically, to, to kind of mimic off of Peter Pagosian's book title, you know, to, to kind of make a handbook for deconverting from Christianity. If you tell me this is true, you walk me through mystery cults enough, you walk me through Greek and Roman uh, gods, you walk me through the, you know, the Pesher stuff, the Mimesis stuff, you walk me through all these concepts, you walk me through the, the math that's woven in, the gematria, you tell me all about it and I go study it. And if I find out you're right, that this stuff is actually not fringe, this is, this looks like it's the woven, it's, this is like the whole behind the scenes of the Bible. This is what you might not see, but it's in between the lines and it's, it's actually the main point of it. The, the main point is not what you thought it was. The main point is, is the mystery stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, would that deconvert certain people? Almost like th- there's no way this can be real. This is obviously mythology. I'm curious. I'm not enough of a psychologist to guess as to what personalities might do it. But. It would be my guess. And I mean this. Um, some people maybe. Yeah. But I can only speak from my subjective experience and I have a pretty good hunch that I'm onto something when I say this and I'm not, I'm not an expert. Please don't take me to the bank on this, but you might relate anyone watching this and including yourself, Tim might relate. I believe the reason why people become Christians in their teens and in their, in their adulthood, for example, which it's easy to see why a, a child raised would believe that, but becoming a Christian isn't because they know for a fact that Jesus rose from the dead or X, Y, Z miracle happened or whatever. It's because they're influenced emotionally to believe in something that fulfills something for them. Um, I was watching an interview with Joe Rogan and Mike Tyson last night, and I was watching a clip, six minute clip on how he said he was, sexually aroused during fights and i was like whoa this guy's a monster and he's like is that a is that a you know i get this tingly and i'm like what the but he made this point in that statement he said i would wake up in the morning at three in the morning and i train and while i was training i knew that my opponent was asleep and he said i would make myself delusional on purpose i would lie to myself and believe the lie to accomplish the goal and create scenarios in my mind on purpose to win that fight. And it made me work harder. It made me train harder. I told myself the lie that I believed, he said, and sometimes that's needed. So I feel like the pastor who's well-spoken, dear ladies and gentlemen, the Lord is with you. You're not suffering alone. Well, I mean, we all suffer. Come on, dude. That's like, you know, that's like uh, appealing to the common sense of humanity to say, you're going to go through some stuff, but don't worry. He is with you. You're not alone. Reach out, call upon him. It's like, dude, makes you kind of want to when your girl just broke up with you. Makes you kind of want to when your mom just passed away and you hope that you could see her again one day. It's emotion. It's, it's, it's not, you know, uh, hard to see that. And if we could, with the education that we're coming up with, found an emotional way to combat that, not just intellectual, you're not going to buy it most of the time. It's all the reason we're Christians is because we felt something. Okay. Most of us, I'm not going to say there ain't, listen, I'm not painting this 100% across the board, but I felt stuff. Okay. I was experiencing something. And when I left, I was coming off drugs. I was trying to get clean off opiates. And I remember feeling feelings I haven't felt in a long time. And if anyone has ever experienced the opiate withdrawal, you start to get goosebumps. You start to remember things. You kind of remember life is good. You don't have to have the drugs to be happy. And um, 
while I was withdrawn, I started watching these broader videos on YouTube that kind of explain that Jesus is similar to other gods and stuff. And I could not believe what I was hearing, but the music in the background, when they were teaching it, they had a subtleness about them that made me feel comfortable. It wasn't like in your face, hardcore. You got, I couldn't watch all of that. Mm. I could watch stuff where they were like, you know, the mystery is that Jesus looks very similar to this God like Dionysus. And let me explain to you why. And it had this emotional tune. If we could package something and say, say somehow fulfill what Christianity gives people, but by explaining that atheism allows you to be able to combat these things and give you a fulfillment as well, you don't have to have a invisible friend, so to speak, to have that answer and that, 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 satisfaction given to you, I think we'd go a long ways. I think a lot of people would leave Christianity for something emotional. And we're not trying to trick them and create an emotion so they have a false uh, come to atheism because uh, it feels good, but we don't want them to go to Christianity just because they're feeling empty or brokenhearted or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you, I've thought a lot about how it's, it's, it reminds me of the issue where when you're a, a kid, and I know you relate to this now because you, as well, you, you got your own kids as, as do I. But when you have a, a parent above you that you want their approval, you want to be like, hey, that's a great job you did on your drawing. Or, hey, you did a great job picking up the sticks in the yard. You did a great job sitting quiet in, in church or whatever. When you hear those words, hey, good job. Thanks for doing that. It, it puts something in your psyche that says, I'm sure it's, it's chemical related, but um, I'm not educated enough to know what those chemicals are, but just that sense of, oh, this is, this is good. I've, I've got people looking at me and saying, good job. And so mm-hmm. if you're used to that your whole life where you're like, all right, if my parents were Christian, I, I've been getting this message all the time from them. And now if they add on your, your church friends and your Bible college friends, and you've got all these people and your, and your ministry, if you're involved in it or your, your small groups, everybody's kind of saying, Good job, good job. And of course, the, the big, you know, the, the big crux of the matter, your sky daddy up in heaven is saying constantly, hey, you opened my book today. You read your Psalm 23. Right. Good job, good job. Thank you for spending time with me with my love letter. And it, it's, got, it's, it's hard. It's, like, it's almost like a withdrawal. Like you've got to train yourself to say, I'm used to feeling people, my, my community, my pretend God, I'm used to them saying, I'm happy with you. You're doing pretty good. Nice work. Mm-hmm. Good progress. And all of a sudden you realize it's, that's never been real and it's, it's never, it's not real now. And it's, it's like, you got to wean yourself from it. And it's, it is, it's, it's hard. And I, I want to ask you on that note, um, just a little, could you give, and I know we're jumping around here, but could you give a little bit of a summary of just kind of where you were in your life? Just, um, I know you, you've been doing some videos where you talk a little bit more about the detailed steps and I, I probably will get into some of those with you on future videos, but just yeah. like in a five or 10 minutes, like what's your, what's your story for anyone that doesn't, didn't get to see that. Um, I was born, uh, make it a quick one as much as possible. Cause it's a lot of details. I'm sure I could get into about my life, but my mother and father, um, they had me in Washington state. I was born in 1988 and um, mom was a Pentecostal. Dad was a Catholic and they met, I suspect at a party with alcohol around and they met and, you know, got married and they fell in love and they had me. And then my brother came right after me. I mean, me and my brother were raised by mom pretty much because dad was a special forces. He always was gone, deployed, fighting for freedom and whatnot. And so we were very patriotic in our lives growing up. Uh, it's always, you know, pro-military. You know, my father is proud to be a son of him. He's a hero. I always looked up to him like you talked about with that. He's also an alcoholic. So there was a lot of uh, emotional abuse there and disconnecting. So um, at Mm -hmm. some point in my early teens, I found myself getting into a situation where I was looking for something that I wasn't getting, you know, from dad. I would think that's just my opinion. My wife's calling me. Sure. One second. I apologize. (laughs) Okay. So, I ended up start going to this house church because while I was at a baseball game, a ball bounced. I was catching. I was the catcher. It bounced and went and hit me underneath my, you know what's. And so uh, I was hurting and he went and got ice and he was a good buddy of mine. We started going to church together. It was a house church. And so 
I went for a long time. There was a lot of emotion in this church. The music that they played was all, I mean, feel good Jesus music. And it, it was very satisfying. Some of it's very good sounding music. Even to this day, I can hear a song and be like, ah, that was a good song. I really did like it. And it's like, but I don't believe what it's saying. I definitely do like the feelings that they give. And I go through as a teen at, at school, um, big into my Bible. A lot of people were like, dude, you're a handsome young man. Why aren't you dating girls? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm, you know, I'm going to follow God. And, you know, that's right now that's it. And it just didn't make sense to people. People thought something's wrong. You know, you're a jock like guy, you have genes like a Greek God and you're over here reading your Bible at lunch and not hitting on girls in the lobby area. It just didn't make sense why a teen at 15, 16 years old wasn't trying to get with girls, but wants to read about Jesus. So a lot of people said you were mature at a young age that you wanted to get into religion. Why don't you wait till you're older and then do that and stuff. And I was like, why wait? Now is the day, the Lord's salvation, blah, blah, blah. So I studied the Bible and I would relapse. I would have struggles with addiction. My father also, like I said, was an alcoholic, but I would, I would do, my life has, it's been a roller coaster up and down with addiction. And, and I, I started smoking pot habitually. I'm an addictive personality anyway. And so I, it was my crutch. I began to smoke it every day, all day. I was skipping school to smoke it. And then I met this girl that I fell in love with and got her pregnant. And so here we are skipping school. I'm fell in my, my second half of my senior year and I ended up pulling myself out of school. So I didn't complete it, but I did come back, but I got my head right with God and started reading the Bible. And I went back the last semester and I remember I started in Genesis chapter one and I said, all right, new beginning. I'm going to do this. It's a new beginning. I'm reading the beginning. So I started reading the beginning of the Bible. And I remember reading the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation out of the King James Version, while going to school simultaneously taking these classes on. And I decided to take a few advanced classes. I was like testing myself. So I took, I took a little bit of advanced math and advanced history and stuff. And so I'm at school. My teacher would walk by and I'd have my little Bible here in the corner of my desk. And I'd be like this, like I'm doing work, but really I'm looking at it reading and then sneak over and slide a page. And then when I'd be late to class and I never meant to be, they'd have to send me after my third time being late in school suspension. That was perfect. I could read my Bible without any problems. And I'd read and I remember going that, to that place. Like I remember seeing the sons of God come down and, and, and see these daughters of men and create giants and evil began to make all man's hearts were continually evil. I mean, it's just this, it was almost like this mix of, uh, of evil um, sons of God or deities, if you will, mixing with humans caused the race of humanity to become corrupt and the flood. I remember getting in the boat with Noah then I remember his son somehow, I mean, the way I understood it then, peeped in the tent and saw his father nude and he was cursed. And then, you know, like I was there. And then the mountain of God, I went with Moses to get the tablets. And the children of Israel through the wilderness as they murmured and they bickered and they complained. And then the serpent that was on the stick that each man had to be bitten and the ones who died didn't enter the promised land. And I went with Joshua and Caleb to spy out the land of the Amalekites or whoever the, the people were. I can't remember the name. You Something know, like a great was, imagination. Yeah, it was my imagination, but I was there. I was with them. So it was an experience that I experienced while reading the story. And Elijah calling fire down from heaven, like all the way through. And the prophets and then Daniel and then getting into the New Testament. I will say this. I think the Old Testament was far better written. In, in many, in a visual sense, personally. Uh, but in the New Testament, it's more complex. So the writings are more complicated. And now that I know about Dennis McDonald and Homeric, you know, mimetic criticism that connects these type of literary uh, devices here, I started to go, whoa, this is, no wonder the narrative didn't feel the same. It's, it's, a, it's a Frankenstein on a whole next level. I went to church. And I'd ask the pastors, you know, I want to learn more. And they said, you should go to college. So I went to Carolina Bible College, which is now more sophisticated sounding. Carolina College of Biblical Studies. That's how they want their title to be called. And I started studying and became a Calvinist. 
I saw good reasons to believe Calvinism. You know, the elect, the chosen, the remnant, Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated. God doesn't hate anybody, Christians say. Have you read your Bibles? Psalms 5, 5, he abhors workers of iniquity. He abhors, he hates the people who do wickedness, who, who work wickedness. So uh, I don't know how he can love you. So if, if you're doing the things contrary to what God says is good, then he hates you. Anyway, um, I started to like have all these questions within the protection or the framework of a Christian type of paradigm. Mm-hmm. Never went outside of that. Watched debates and rooted the Christian on. Never, ever saw the atheist had anything good to bring to the table other than to get beat up by the Christian. So William at that Lincoln, point, you were, you were not even remotely thinking of issues. You were just looking at the ways to maybe defend it apologetically. But only def- if your dad went and you saw your dad in a public place and someone started talking to him like they're about to fight him, whose side are you going to def- who, who are you going to protect? Yeah, your dad. Why? Why are you going to protect your dad? What if your dad was in the wrong? He can't be. I don't give a crap if he was. And this is real. I'm being real when I say this. If I was in a public place and I don't care if my father may have said something wrong or something and someone attacks him, I'm going to put my hands on them. I'm going to find a way to defend my dad no matter what. That's Christian apologetics. Something satisfied them. Somehow, some way, mentally, psychologically, physically, they've experienced some subjective. That's their dad now. They're going to now try to defend their dad. That's pretty much the way I'm looking at it. So I'm protecting dad and I constantly go through these waves where I do good for a while, relapse, do good for a while, relapse. And when I'd relapsed, I would allow my worldview to be changed. I never would when I wasn't relapsed because while I was clean, I was kind of like how they talk about Jesus came and he says to the Pharisees, you know, I didn't come for you. I came for those who are wicked, for the unrighteous, for the dirty, for the leper, for the poor. You're righteous already, right? Like, (laughs) haha. Well, I got to a place where I was kind of like that Pharisee and I had the truth. I knew it. And then I'd relapse. And when I'd relapse, I'd realize maybe I don't have all the answers. Like I was able to ask questions, but not leave Christianity yet. This many years of this going on. And I think what happened the last time is I had peeped in to just somehow it allowed me to say, what if Christianity is wrong? I think I was going to 12 step AA meetings where other people had different conceptions of gods. I had to somehow tolerate that, even though I never was like, there are no other gods. There's only one God and it's this God. And I would say that kind of stuff in AA, like my God, which, you know, was the perfect man who lived uh, 2000 years ago, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'd give these things while I AA and people respected it, but not everyone agreed with me. And I said, how the heck can they get along with me? And yet I'm saying these things. One day I questioned it. It just happened. I allowed to allowed that to, to be a question in my mind when I was watching videos on YouTube while withdrawing on the couch off of opiates. Mm-hmm. And while I sat there and laid there and I heard these guys say, Jesus is like other gods. I said, I don't know if this is true, but I need to look into it more. And I found Robert M. Price and I found a chariot ass and other people as well. But I found these guys and girls that taught this and I started digging deeper because I could still with the idea that the other gods look like Jesus and that he might be a parallel in many ways, I could still believe in a God, but the God I now believed in what satisfied me was he's bigger than just Christianity. He's not just the God that you see in the new Testament or the old Testament. All humanity has all of these characteristics in their religious beliefs that are all similar And the reason why they all look alike in my head was because the God of this universe, of all things, this source energy, the platonic divine, if you will, the one source, the perfect, immutable God. The idea. (laughs) um, You know, has shined like the elephant in the blind men, you know, into all these religions. And they're all trying to touch the one true divine so i started to research outside of christianity because then it's okay it's safe because my god is bigger now it's still my god though i'm okay i'm in comfortable territory and once i went outside of christianity seeing god was bigger than just the bible god that god he's like a fraction of the picture i started to go okay hold on hold on i'm bumping into a lot of people are going there may not be a god and explaining the natural approach of why did did God really set, make the earthquake? 
you know, I started asking natural questions that I would never have asked as answers to the questions. So it, you know? When you first listen to people like uh, Dr. Bob, Robert Price, Macharya, are you looking at it from a perspective where you're just trying to think, how do I prove that they're wrong? Or was any of it kind of get through some of the armor? How would you describe that part of it? I was finally at a humbled state where I was willing to listen, not just say they were wrong. I was at a point where, the, let, me, let me back up just a hair. In this transition period, I bumped into a really good friend named Mark. I cannot name him fully. His mom is not gone, and his mama, his mama's a Christian. So if she saw or heard that he wasn't, she'd probably die literally from the stress. You can imagine. Uh, that's how bad this can be. It's like you, they think they're going to go to hell, and all that kind of stuff can come from it. So anyway, Mark uh, contacts me about astrotheology stuff and try to explain why some of this stuff is not literal. And I said, let me ask you a question first before we start talking. I don't know this guy from Adam, dude. And the guy's got my number. So he contacts me and he says, uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to share with you some information. You could tell you wanted to tell me some stuff. And I, but I had this like gut. I have a pretty good, I can read people pretty well. And I know that he's going to share something, but I can also tell he's not a Christian. It doesn't seem. So I was like, but are you an atheist? I said, just tell me. And psychologically, I was set my, I was hyping myself up because I was like, if you're a Christian, I mean, if you're an atheist and you're just honest with me, just tell me the truth. I don't want to, you know, any lies or anything. And I'll listen to you either way. He said, I'm an atheist. I don't hmm. believe there's a God. And as much as I said that, I still had reservations. Like I heard him, but I was like, ah, oh, like there was part of me still not willing to really completely listen to him. As he started talking to me though, he didn't talk about God not existing which I really, I'm glad he didn't for me because he just showed, look at Samson, look at, uh, look at David. All right. Now look at Goliath and, and look at um, Hercules. So he started taking me in these like little basic kid images, so to speak, parallels where you look at Hercules, look at what he did, look at the things that he compares to biblical characters as and I started going, oh, wow. And then he talked about how they connected to some celestial uh, counterparts, so to speak. A heavenly one, and then you got the earthly, or the story of the actual person. An anthropomorphized version, if you will, of the heavens. And when he started doing that, I started going, oh, crap. So I started investigating even outside of the Bible a little, like looking at the pyramids, for example, why the pyramids and geese are lined up with the Orion's belt. And, you know, you kind of ask, like, did they have a cosmology connecting heaven and earth as above, so below or on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus says. And I'm like, what is going on here? Is their cosmology connected to some type of image of above and below? And even the cosmology in Genesis one, I saw there was clear creation, you know, celestial bodies. And then you see the earthly bodies, you know, birds, fish, animals, humans, Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15 with the, I like to say, new creation. First, there's one of the, the stars and one of the moon and one of the sun. And then and he talks about all this. And then he goes into the animals and all that. He's talking about a, a resurrection situation here or a new creation. And I just, uh, I, I realized there was so much I didn't know. So when I realized that, I had to humble myself a little more and listen and he was so gentle with me, though. I needed him to be gentle. The reason I was a Christian to begin with, if you wanted to get psychological, is I was broken. I felt, I felt emotionally like there was a lot of problems. So that's what allowed me to listen to this guy. And then down the road, I became more acquainted with the material and was interviewing them, not being as outspoken about it, but listening. And then uh, it, it became to a point where people wanted to hear what I had to say because I started to kind of put pieces together myself. Yeah. It sounds oh, and, like and, and with Dr. Price, by the way, I didn't um even with him, what I learned with this whole thing is be even skeptical of the skeptics. So I, I literally I don't believe everything Dr. Price says. I take it in as a piece of evidence, I put it on a shelf, I analyze it. I don't just believe it, even though he's like one of my best friends when it comes to this stuff. So Yeah, and the cool thing is some of the the ways he phrases things, you can tell he's not sure he believes it too. It's it's more like that. He's, he's so good at saying, he said it, I've heard it a number of times, I'm sure he said it a lot more than that, but this concept of this is the best we've got now, pending better evidence. And it's like, right. that's what a great, great way to just describe it and, and including this journey to figure out what happened. Um, and it seems like 
any time that you listen to someone explain something about where this came from, you know, a month or two later, you hear something, you're like, that, that kind of adds and maybe even changes the story. And yeah, there's so many pieces to it. And I, I love it. And it, the thing that I think our stories are very similar, and I'll tell you mine in another video, but the, the effect that I hear you saying that was similar to me was the way we talk about your mind gets blown. It's like, you can only get your mind blown so many times where you're like, <laughs> all right, there's, there's something else. This, what I thought was going on with my worldview, with my belief, my dogma, my, yep. pers my personal relationship with, with Christ, what I thought was going on is not real. So it, might, it might still be there at first, but something's got to change. But eventually, as you go down that rabbit hole enough, you're like, this isn't what I thought it was. It's, it's not even close to what I thought it was. And that eventually, you I just, mean, unless you choose to voluntarily say, I'm going to bury this. Like, you know that guy, um, yeah. Drew, genetic modif modified skeptic? He had one yeah. story where he told some lady that he worked with, she came to him and said, Drew, did you know that there was all these other gospels and all these other books of the New Testament? Like, tons of them. Like, a whole big list of them. Why didn't they ever tell us about those? And I, I don't know if Drew ever added to the story, but the way he kind of, I think he left it there was like, she just kind of like was frustrated at that fact, but kind of like brushed it aside. Like it's just a, it's an anomaly to deal with another day. It's like, no, no, like put that right back up front. You know, put that, that's not an anomaly. That's part of the, that's the part of the core of this puzzle. And you can't just push stuff aside. And it's like, when you get the, 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 bravery the self-bravery to say i'm going to stop pushing this away i'm going to stop harmonizing the stuff that clearly can't harmonize i'm going to figure out what's going on you you literally open the pandora's box to say in a good sense to say i'm open to being like you said very humbled very wrong what i thought was so is not so and i'm not out to to, to, to make everyone else look like you guys didn't know anything about the bible you guys are are, are all deceivers, although I do, I do sincerely think some of them are very deceptive, but there's some great Christians who honestly, they honestly think that this is real and they don't want to deceive anybody. They just want to save you from hell. They want you to experience God's love and, and the, the reason for your even existing. And so they come up with, with this stuff, but like when you have the bravery to say, I'm not attacking you and I'm not necessarily even calling myself an idiot. I'm just saying, I didn't know a whole bunch of stuff that now I do. And with this information, something's got to give either I got to debunk it seriously debunk it or what I thought was true is not the same thing as reality. Yeah. You bring up some interesting stuff. Why are there all these gospels? You know, there's just so many questions like that that aren't necessarily just that, that you have to start asking. And the fact that we have the canon and why do we stick to the canon? We're told to believe these things and we're told to accept what the Orthodox church has, uh, you know, painted the picture for that. They're, they're Orthodox. correct. Yeah. They have the right, uh, you know, books and all that good stuff. Right. So well, of course they do. Cause they burned all the others. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's get rid of what I think's wrong, but why are people, why are people writing on, all this and so i can defend that i can defend why from from the apologist christian apologist standpoint and say why i can make a great argument that you heard a million times from Will lane craig or you've heard from robbie zacharias so you've heard from other apologists because that's who i loved that's who i watched why if i knew them so well why if i've listened to these guys a thousand times do i think there's more than what they're not telling us why why you know have you ever interviewed any of those guys by the way no, I wanted to meet Ravi Zacharias. Of course, he died not too long ago, but he was a huge guy that I liked because he was such an emotional apologist. He was, yeah. he, he, William Lane Craig comes at this uh, sophisticated and philosophical, whereas Ravi, you felt like, you know, there's an emotion there and he's sincerely emotional about it and stuff. That's what I connected with. But uh, he made me think that Christianity is intelligent. He made me believe that there was a, a serious intelligence to the belief and that uh, you're really a wise and smart person who has the facts on his side by being a Christian. And that's when I started to give truly, um, over time I gave Dr. Price and others uh, a fair shake on saying, well, what are you saying? And Dr. Price came in and he wasn't saying the whole zeitgeist stuff. Everyone who hears him compare gods and stuff thinks, oh, this is zeitgeist. Dude, let me tell you something about Dr. Price. I asked, I've asked him countless times, 
Dr. Price. And I comment about Zeitgeist and he's like, I've never even watched the video. I can't comment on it. I don't know what it's about. Is so I said, well, out? like purposely, like, I don't want to see it. He said he's not really concerned with seeing it. He's already heard enough about it that he thinks, you know, he doesn't really care to watch. But I said, Dr. Price, we have to do a video, though, where we go through the movie, pause it, you comment, and you say, mistake, here's why, correct, here's why, and give your, give your opinion on it and, and go through. Because at least we can have somebody, so that way they can't say, oh, you're Zeitgeist, because you, he's not. But you know, that doesn't mean that Zeitgeist doesn't have some serious, interesting things and truth to it. Uh, but because it's got a lot of stuff in it that people would say isn't true, uh, you, th you can easily try and discredit something like that. And so yeah. it's not as simplified as this direct genealogical connection like they want to make it yeah. uh, to Horace and Jesus and this and that. There could be some connections, but they make it so simplified. It's more complicated than that. It's yeah. not as simple as that. Now, some things are obvious. Dr. Price would admit Osiris. He does think there's a clear connection between Osiris and Jesus, you know? Yeah. You know, it'd be funny to do. I don't think this is probably the best way to do it, but just a, a funny way to do it. You know, those YouTube videos where someone will film a person and the, the cameras at their face, but they're actually watching like a movie and mm -hmm. some emotional part where it's like, Hey, watch the end of star Wars or something. And, and you see them like, they're excited and then they're in tears. It'd be funny to see his face where he's like, like, like you can see him nodding like, yep, yep. And all of a sudden he just says like, oh no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that, <laughs> whatever he's, or that or right? a little like, huh, not sure hmm. what, you're, what you're doing there. Uh, yep, yeah, not gonna buy that. Yep, yeah, no, I'd love that. I do wanna try and get him to watch it sometime, but if he's gonna watch it, I want him to watch it on camera. I want yeah. his first experience to be recorded. Uh, with it because I thought it was the heezy vasheezy man I thought it was right when I first saw it because I was it blew me away because there was some interesting facts that I thought were interesting agricultural connections because that I'd never thought about I mean like as a Christian if someone tells you for example have you ever thought about why there's so many other gospel other gospels uh, have you ever thought about the origins of why mystery schools might have played a part in the early Christianity what are you talking about? It was a Jew in the middle of the, he was a, in the same vein of, of Judaism as a, what do you mean mystery school? I have no clue what you're talking about. The pastor don't talk about this. Nobody talks about this because they don't care about these components. They have a theological divine position they're presenting. And it's their Jesus and their Christianity. And that's, that's all they're trying to give you. They don't really care to like make you get confused and go, why do we not have the book of Enoch in our canon? They don't really want you to, to think. They want you to think the way they think to make it simple. And that's it. it. They don't even think that way. So why would they want you to think that way? And so that's, yeah. I have to think that way now. I'm looking at the stuff. So agricultural, what do you mean? Uh, like we go through the cycles of seasons and stuff. And the ancient religions were tied in with this. And I love Dr. John Knight Lenwall, a good friend of mine. And he's not a mythicist. He, he's a historicist. However, he does point out how in the ancient cosmology of oral-minded people, prior to writing, that tells you how far back you got to go, right? Really far. Thousands and thousands of years. They connected things that we today compartmentalize and know to separate. We don't know to separate them back then. Today, we have writing. We could put it in storage, and we know how to – our hardware is the same as theirs, but our software is different. So the way we, we, we're we able to separate ideas, we know how to do that now that we have writing, and it's done something to allow us to do that. In the ancient world, if you and me were getting ready, hey, all right, winter's over, stuff's starting to turn green, hey, there's that star that comes up every year when everything starts to turn green. That star has the power of life in it, and that star is Venus or whatever, you know? And you start going, oh, my gosh, it only appears at this certain place once a year. That's a holy – that's a god, by the way. It's not just a star the way we think. That's a god, and that god has power over death, and it conquers life, or it makes life come and conquers death. And therefore, now we have life come to earth again because of that power from that star. Yeah. Today, we'd go, that's just a star that comes up every once in a while, and we know how to separate them. But they connected those things. Yeah. I was just reading on this one about the blood, uh, not the blood, the, um, the rivers that would turn really red. There was at least two of them that I was reading about, two different spots uh, in, that, in that part of the world where just all of a sudden some flood would occur, bring certain chemicals that were in the you know, surrounding dirt up, and all of a sudden 
your your river is so so red and and they started to explain it through these stories and it is it's it that that going back to the context it's like you have to know how these people thought they didn't look up at the stars without thinking about i mean at least a lot of them is, and probably the ones that influenced the bible the most the layers of heaven the angelology the cosmology the underworld all this stuff and it you have to think like them to, to get it and, and the amazing yeah. thing is when you read when, once you get some of this information you go back to the same stories in the very in the bible not just general ancient literature but the bible itself you read you know john 21 153 fish and you're thinking i know exactly what somebody who was a pythagorean mystery school person would have thought when they heard jesus pulled a hundred or told them there's 153 fish in that net um or, or, or told them to pull it and that's the number that they counted they would know <clears throat> I mean, they would know exactly what's going on there they're they're giving absolute homage to pythagoras through that and and the, the you know i think that number might be related to, to pi uh joel pearson sent me a link i need to get more educated on what that means but just you put that stuff together and you're like these people would have read this bible so differently we don't know that context and without it you you can't understand it and and once you do understand it in my opinion you can't be a literal bible believer anymore you can't and you can't right. be a, a, with, once you bring in the parallels too to me christianity is, is over at that point and that's where i feel like i'm motivated by my project to say like look i want to do my best to put this information on the table and to do that, I need to get as educated as I can. That's, that's my encouragement to, to other people. And I'm like, like, look, just, just study it. You don't have to agree with me or whoever. Study this information, but not from an apologist perspective only. Study the whole gamut. Anyway, um, I, went, I, I got us off track. I forget how I did that, and I apologize. <laughs> but I wanted to get back to your final stages. Well, Where, let, me, let me say one thing about Pythagoras, yeah, of course. Please, because that's that, that 153 fish... That that kind of that adds to one little itty bitty piece of evidence that just kind of makes you start seeing outside the box. Like, why would that author use Pythagorean mathematics in their story? Like, why 153 fish? The number 153 is a triangular number, a perfect triangular number. So what that means is, if you don't mind me sharing a, a image here, let yeah. me see. You disabled attendee sh screen sharing. So um, it should be at the bottom. I don't know. I could be wrong. Might be the eye in the top left. I don't know. Anyway, um, one fifty three is calculable if you do one plus two plus three, literally like this, up to nineteen. You literally just add the next number in sequential, you know, order. One plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six, all the way up to nineteen. You have one hundred fifty three. But also what's interesting, and I don't know if this plays its part, it wouldn't surprise me, is if you take one, five, and three, and you were to add to it five, one, three, five, 13, same numbers, just shifted in a different order. You have six, six, six. And so uh, you can shift those numbers in a couple different orders and you have six, six, six. It doesn't work every time with every, each number you can't know. But there's a couple times if you shift those numbers around, you get 666. I kind of wonder, I kind of wonder if John, the apocalypse, is borrowing once again a Pythagorean uh, mathematics because he does talk about the perfect uh, amount, the 12,000 from each tribe, mm -hmm. the 144,000 virgin Israelite males. Uh, and, you know, man was created on day six. Now, an interesting thing about man being created on day six is how many hours, 24 hours, are in six days, 144 hours. So here you have a creation of a new man, the 144,000, a new day or the sixth day, and then God rests. So, yeah. so much that does not get touched on and investigated. Anyway, I cut you off. And when you take, when you add a... <clears throat> A minimalist perspective on the Old Testament. Uh, you know, you go into the rest of American stuff. You can see like this stuff isn't just the, the, the New Testament either. And no. it's like, okay, wow, the, the Greeks they the Greeks have their fingers in this a lot more than we realized. That I mean, I know it's it's much more. It's you know, it's Romans, it's ancient Near East stuff. But the Greeks they wove this thing together in a way that's amazing. But when you 
when you get all this stuff and you start pouring it in, at what point did it start to tip your balance? Like what, what was it that was like, okay, we've got, I'm no longer like, if this is heavy on Christianity, I'm now like, even, I'm not sure what's going on, but I think it's going to fall right back. Christ is Lord. Jesus is God. The Bible's the infallible word of God. What starts to tip it? Like, I think there might be a problem. Yeah, I would say a combination of evidence. It took a while. It's not as easy as just saying, oh, this one piece thing. I went, aha, and I found out. If there is that moment, I cannot remember that moment. You know what I mean? If there was that moment, because so much mind-blowing stuff started happening. I I really think it was, uh, for me, it was a combination of information over periods of time. I mean, if you go to early Myth Vision shows that I've done, I have, uh, I've interviewed Timothy Freak. Uh, I've interviewed uh, other people who are believers to some degree in some way, shape or form. Uh, They have a mystical type of faith and I'm okay with that. Uh, But I, I, I started going into the, like I said, there's a universal principle, God being spirit type thing. And what started to tip me, I think was the trying to explain things the way that people who believe in a God or consciousness exist apart from our being and stuff like, like uh, there's the argument that we have consciousness and we're just almost like a a soul with a flesh body type thing. And that there's some consciousness Uh, to me, I started asking questions like did conscious is consciousness, my mind, you know, am I kind of a computer, a biological computer and that consciousness developed. Uh, This is why I don't remember when I was three days old, you know, the brain starts to produce and develop to a point where memory starts to, to come. And, And it took more of a natural explanation. I mean, evolution started taking its, its weight. Did we come from previous species? I just don't get the old age earth and the in the the long evolution like i just don't get that from the bible i don't see how you can use that as an interpretive paradigm even when i did listen to old earth creationists try to debate these things uh it didn't make sense to me i look at a thumbprint on a gorilla that has pigmentation issues on their hand and they have like their melanin's not like it is with a gorilla and it has white right and i look at this image of a white person's hand next to the gorilla that had issues with their pigmentation And it looked like a human in so many respects. And I just thought to myself, how could I not consider that we're related in some aspect and some ancient cousins of ours or something here? And when I started to investigate that, I said, okay, there's a natural explanation. Everything we once attributed to the divine, Christians still do this. Why did uh, uh, New Orleans get flooded by the hurricane? God's judgment for the gays. Uh, What? Yeah, uh, because of your sins, there's still this stuff being believed that God's bringing a hurricane. And so when you explain them, well, you know how hurricanes come to be and why they exist, right? There's always a hurricane season. What if we all became nuns and priests and took this thing serious and we still had hurricane season? What would you say then? Would you run to Job and say, well, God's still allowing Satan to test us? I mean, it's you always have an excuse. Yeah. There's always an excuse for why evil happens or why bad things happen, or why earthquakes, famines, wars, diseases, and all that kind of stuff happens. However, I took consideration the natural explanations. And when we were able to explain how they happen naturally, it took away, uh, like if there was a chess board and God's on one side and naturalism or a natural explanations on the other, every single move started to get overrun by, we can explain this. Without needing to say the divine did it. Now, there's still people who want to go, but behind the natural, God still made it happen. Prove that. Prove that, and I'm with you. Other than that, man, I think that you can see the evolution of gods, and that started blowing my mind. Like, how could a god be attributed to thunder? The reason that thunder comes is a god happens. Now we know there's magnetism, the core of the earth. You know, and there's reasons, electricity, and uh, there's science behind why all these things occur. Do we really have to say that was Zeus? You know, was that Yahweh? Was that, And that's what started to tip the hat, I think, slowly for me. And explaining these passages that were divine and understood the way that I understood them to giving a human explanation. Why yeah. 153 fish? Uh, why are you borrowing? Why do you need to borrow from Pythagoras? Why do you need to quote a pagan poet, Paul, in Acts 17? Uh, five 
centuries prior to Jesus's existence. Yeah. Never once did Paul even quote Jesus himself, but he quotes a pagan poet. I was, Why not? I was just yeah. reading this past uh, weekend about quotes from people like Plato that are not just in the special, you know, section in Acts where Paul's given his testimony, but it's like woven into the epistles. I mean, why are you going to Plato, not just like once for a half a sentence, just to kind of bring a cultural relevance, but you're like quoting him over and over. Like, why do we have to quote Plato? We've got the God of the universe to give us wisdom. And it's like, it, this, I mean, the big thing that I like to say is, it, this just doesn't sound right. I mean, yes, it's, it's possible. You could, you could argue in certain frames of mind that you think it's plausible, but from where I'm sitting, it just, it just kept, and this is part of the deconversion. It's just this unending string of that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right either. You, you know, and we could go on and on and I'm, I'm sure we'll cover a lot of it over our videos, but you add enough, that doesn't sound right to your worldview. And you're like, and it gets to a point of, of the question of why am I defending it? Why do I feel an obligation to defend this? And especially, this is what got me, and I'll, I'll go into this more uh, someday when I'm uh, talking more about my story, but why am I defending genocide? And I know people, oh, it wasn't what you thought. It, you know, you don't know the mm -hmm. culture. History, but just textually, it says, go in, slaughter everybody, kill the animals, but keep the young girls. Like, that's what it says, you know, anybody, and, and, you know, you, you could read 30 books from some PhD scholar at a Christian university and find out that there's nuances of what it might have looked like and might have meant um, the slavery issue, you know, you can beat your slave and, and as long as they get up in two days, um, you're okay. Uh, land theft, obviously, the racism, the misogyny, endless issues. And you think, I am defending this. What, what what's causing me to stay defending something I'm not comfortable with? I mean, honestly, if you were, you know, if, if, if you were literally, I mean, I know that the, the people that were talking about Christians today, they, they wouldn't want you to do genocide. Now they'd say, no, no, it's a different age. But like, if, if you were to say, well, well, what if God did command it again? And I've talked to people where I've, I've said, if, if God commanded again, if your, if your child, even as an adult child is, is disobedient, enough times, you know, bad enough that you're allowed to stone them to death with the elders of the city, would you do it? And I've had, I've had Christians say right to my face in front of their kids, yes, I would obey God and stone my kid. And at what point do you say, I'm not defending this anymore. I'm walking away. It just, it blows my mind. It really yeah. does. Well, you know, we've left the, the box. I didn't even analyze that stuff like that till I was comfortable later. You know, uh, which is, at, by the way, it's com complete BS that someone would say yes to that because I know I wouldn't have even as deep into the religion as I was because I'd, I'd run to other examples. I'd run to David and show David made some serious mistakes. He was a man after God's own heart, which is an excuse, of course, for why I made mistakes. So, but either way, I wasn't going to do that to my kid just because no, 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 that's stupid. And, and uh, it is stupid today, but in the ancient world, goodness gracious, it just shows you that if God is all knowing and knows the future, why did he allow such things or even, well, I'm only working in this time. He didn't see an overarching, uh, there's not an overarching um, universal moral in which God would stand by. I mean, he didn't, he didn't know in a couple thousand years that humans would say we're more moral than you are like yeah. that just kind of, now that's an interesting thing I look at now, but I didn't look at that even in the transition phase out because as I transitioned out, it was about all these key details that made me look at investigating what if, I mean, I even thought for a moment I was yeah. investigating what if all this is astro theology? What if everything is celestial and there's no history there necessarily? There's nuggets of reality on earth, but it's all like a code for the heavens. Yeah. And as I, I started going down that trail and wondered, but I had too many, I have too many questions for that to be the totality. Don't get me wrong. That plays a huge role, plays a huge role. But I tried to see if that would fit everything and i was looking at like the devil's pulpit uh which is a book written by a pastor who left christianity and he's mythicist he didn't believe jesus actually existed and he actually uh is robert taylor and uh he wrote on pretty much how it's all astrotheology it's it's a story about the uh 
the stars and such and everything. There is keys to that. And there are people I still entertain the idea. I just am not sold on it completely because I do think right. there was a real war in 70. I think there was a real stuff going on. There's a lot of history here that I don't, I can't say it's all a celestial myth. There's, right. there is stuff there. Don't get me wrong, but that didn't make me look at the genocide situations yet. I just was looking at how, how could I have this paradigm at the very least, it destroys the worldview that I once held and made me question. Now, what do I do? Run to a liberal Christianity, which allows me to think this way just so I can stay in my comforts, or am I going to really look for truth? And as I started looking, I said, dude, something's wrong. It just, why is this not what, why aren't we talking about this at church or why aren't the professors discussing this? They, they, nobody's, they're not. Yeah. It's, it's, they have this story and they buy it. And I think as I was leaving Christianity I became a full preterist, which we haven't gotten into yet. They had, to, they had like ideas that when Jesus ascended in acts to go to heaven, that he cast it off his body. There was an idea that he cast off his body. And this is by full preterists who claim to be Christians in the same vein as Orthodox Christianity. And they're trying to fit in with orthodoxy. However, I don't think they realize how, I'm going to use the term, Gnostic, uh, they really are in their thinking that Jesus came back, the end happened. You have to redefine terms compared to the way that they're defined by Christians to say the end happened, but it didn't literally happen. And so th there's so many issues that... Well, that, that brings yeah. up too the issue I, I think about a lot is um, Christians don't seem to realize like they're not able to see myself included just how bizarre it all is like when you think to yourself i believed and i know they wouldn't use this phrase um blood magic but you know what once you're out you're like no that that was that was blood magic that was you know yeah call it what you want it while you're in it but it's it's blood magic um <laughs> you know the whole I, i'm you know this god that 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 does like with Abraham and Isaac, this God that wants you to be so different from the other tribes that are killing their kids for their gods. He wants you to not sacrifice your children. So what's he going to do? He's going to test you and say, I'd like you to kill your child. What do you say? And he's praised for saying, sure, I'll do it. And it's like, that's bizarre morality. Apart from the astral theology that might be involved in that, that's bizarre. Like the morality issue. And, and it, especially when you, when you get into, uh, for me, the, the whole Yahweh L, like where did that, where did his name and character come from? And all of a sudden you're like, I'm into something weird, not the cults, not the isms and the schisms. I'm into something weird. They might be into a, a version of the weirdness, but I'm, it isn't like here's Christianity with its orthodoxy and they're way over in some la la land making stuff up. Like we're all in the same boat together making stuff up. We're all in la la land. The goal isn't to find some better version of this. It's to walk away. And it, it's, it's scary when you think. Well, look, let's take it slow, right? Yeah. This is interesting you're saying this. An evolution of how, this, how these religions and blood magic work. Can you imagine going back? Let's just say we were born in an Aztec region where they behead people or they cut out the heart of a living person on the top of their pyramid and, and, tumble the body down the steps to appeal to the sun god right and they thought this really appeased the sun god um and we thought that was true well what i think if you look at the old testament or hebrew scriptures you find yahweh telling Abra or uh yeah abraham to kill isaac and sacrifice his firstborn son to him and he he, he goes missing from the narrative from that point on but it acts like in our an hour version like okay he was going to do it but he put a ram instead and they sacrificed an animal quite interesting can you imagine if we had a million christians together and we all, and they all were up close and personal handed the knife and said now cut the goat's throat bleed him out and sacrifice him for the lord everyone must cut the throat of the animal and watch the blood spill and then sacrifice this animal by burning it after you saw it alive and your very hands are the one that took the breath away from this animal. Can you imagine how Christians would feel about a religion like that? Yeah. Christianity came out of that. 
So, you know, or partially came out of that because it, it, there's combinations to Christianity that obviously mystery school stuff, things like that. But even then you're drinking the blood of the God, so to speak, yes. in some magical sense, it's the divine so is weird. entering you. Right. And you don't really think like this. This is yeah. not Christian thinking, but this is really what it's coming from. They just have got a very, um, you, you, you have songs that play on the radio and those songs are edited where you don't hear cussing, but you have the real version the real version's raw, unedited in that sense, and you can hear what it's saying. That's really what the church is doing is they're teaching a very pretty picture. Sometimes they'll say, oh, no, this is such an ugly picture that God put his all sin on his son. Do you hear? Now, I understand how they make it sound and word it in a way that sounds good. That's magic too, man. The yeah. way they're wording this as if this is a good thing, that his son, this human, is dying for your actions. Oh man. So we look at this now and we could say, uh, yeah, I'm good. You know, I'm good. Well, the, it's funny. You used the word at the beginning, uh, in a different context, talking about fringe, you know, with fringe theories that you bring onto your podcast, but bringing it into this part of the conversation, like you don't, you don't realize it till you're out. You're like, I was like Christianity is not in terms of our religions, but just Christianity versus reality. Christianity is itself entirely fringe like yeah. we're not like when you say well how fringe is it to say maybe you know joseph atwell was right well maybe that's fringe maybe it's not it depends on what you how you know, where you, what your uh you know best understanding of it all is maybe so and so is right about this aspect of it maybe it was a copy from this god or that god but we're all looking at it and saying maybe that's where it started maybe that's fringe i don't know i'll do some more research but when you say, let me just research reality, Christianity is absolutely fringe. And it's like this whole thing, it, it amazes me. And, and I, I'm staggered when you read the occasional story or YouTube video of somebody that says, I was an atheist and I went to Christianity. And I know Aaron Rod does this much better than I could ever phrase it, but it's like, I want to know what did you discover that made it right? Like, like what part of like, so, so when you study the mystery cults and you study the ancient gods and you studied astro theology, you studied Gematria, you studied Pythagoras, you studied so much more that we're not even starting to talk, talk about mm -hmm. all these issues. What part of that made you suddenly think this is real? Or, you know, and I know a lot of people say, well, you, you probably didn't leave Christianity for the right reasons. So it was easy to get back in. You left for a relationship or for, suppose a peace, your family fell apart, or your money fell apart. So you needed peace community and you know, you, you got it and you know with the church, but if you're really distinct to the issues, there is no reason to go back because there's no reason to be in it in the first place. There's no reason to call this an actual relationship with a real God and a real savior. And it's like, I, I've heard the question posed to some people like, what would, what would cause you to believe in God again? Not to me, but just, you know, in YouTube videos, what would cause right. you to believe that, that, you know, what would make you consider yourself less of an atheist and maybe starting to move to towards agnostic or maybe considering, again, Christianity might be true. Like, technically, yes, there's probably something that someone could say that would, I would have to agree with the way they phrase it. But when you step back and you think this stuff is so wicked weird, I mean, absolutely bizarre, and you add on the... The, all the morality stuff, the genocide and, and all this. And then you think about the brainwashing dynamics. You think, I, I am so susceptible to brainwashing, mm -hmm. to being tricked by this stuff, to what, I mean, who, who doesn't want an afterlife where you're with your loved ones forever and there's never pain? Who doesn't want that? Yeah. But it's like, you, once you realize what this is, there is nothing you could say to get me back in. There, I mean, there's, I wouldn't want to be back in. It's like getting out of the matrix don't try to plug me back in because I know what you are now that the curtain, like you said, the curtains pulled back. I know what's behind the matrix. Right. And this is just a system of or their, their phraseology. This is a system of control, control people's thoughts, control society, perhaps, but control yep. people. And it's also just, it's like a mass delusion. Like I was tricked by my parents. They were tricked by their parents. Not that they would say it that way, but we're all tricked. I'm not going to suddenly buck the system. This is how we be good people. We are good people because we follow the book. And exactly. you, you, can't, you can't live your life based on that kind of premise. You have to live it on truth. 
I think fear would be a major player as to why people end up going from atheism to theism if they have researched any. I don't think that they're in it because they – uh, there's like sufficient evidence, like we talked about. We, we want people to leave, right? We want to try and help people see what we see and things like that. And this, at least consider that if you believe there's a divine being or you have some theism somewhat in your head, uh, okay, well, whatever. But to be Christian and to buy the narrative, uh, the only reason I could think someone would even self delude themselves is to go into that. It would be fear and emotion. So is it, fear is an emotion, so to speak, but uh, other emotions as well. I mean, they might be alone. They may just need community. And, and people will do things and believe things that you're going to go, what the, why would that woman stay with him? She just found out that he's been cheating on her for 18 years with three different women and has a whole nother family with these women. Like, why are you still with him? Well, it's all she knows, or that's something, it, it, there's some problems there. You might go, but why? That makes no logical sense. Well, if you know the reason humans do things they do, then yet you might say that's why. So that's why I think emotionally, if we can present things and, and have some emotion there, not just sound like robots and intelligent nerds behind a computer screen talking about interesting stuff, but bring feeling to it and let yeah. them know they're not alone. You know, my last time I got clean was almost five years ago. And when I got clean, I, I remember crying out and I said a prayer. I did. I, I sat there by myself in my head. I didn't do this. I didn't go, dear Lord. No, I sat there in my head and I said inside of my head, if you do not help me, I'm going to die. I will not live. I will not make this. I don't have the strength to quit doing heroin. I need the strength to do it. And I remember just saying like that prayer and I meant what I said. And I got clean. I got clean, but here's the thing. As I got clean, I looked back about a year later at when I had said that prayer, I realized, I realized the truth. I realized that I had talked to myself as real as I could be, that you better pull your head out of your ass and you've got to make it. I thought there was something divine there. I thought I, I thought it was God that saved me. I and Christians will say, "Yep, it was." Till this day, you know, you're missing it. You're right. God did help you. You know what? You're right, Christian. You're right. God did help me. I helped me. You're absolutely right. And there's a, a rap song by Hobson. If you haven't heard it. It's Hobson, Ill of Mind 7. He was a hardcore Christian, but he cussed and he, you know, did things so he didn't fit quite into the Christian paradigm completely. And um, in his Ill of Mind 7, he starts talking about, I never had a talking snake talk to me. He starts to wrap this stuff out. And in it, he kind of expresses this, uh, you know, quit lying. We are you. You are us talking to God. And then, you know, he kind of goes back. He, he, he goes back and forth between, he's like, you know what? If you reveal yourself to me, I'll, I'll, I'll hang out with a group of nuns and every step I won't take, but in the name of you. Like he starts to say stuff like we would, like reveal yourself. I'm Thomas. I will put my finger in your side. I will fill your hands. And if you're real, everything I say, I repent. I will follow you till I die and beyond forever. If I knew that this was true. I mean that. I'm not just saying this. I mean that. If you could prove it to me, if he came down right now and somehow told me, Psh, what are we doing? We're wasting our time, Tim. Tim, I'm here to tell you, man, it's true, and you're mistaken, brother. Not because the Bible says it. Forget the Bible. I just actually experienced this. I know he came, and I wasn't tripping. It wasn't a hallucination. You know, it was true. I had witnesses. There's 12 of us here right now. Just do it again. Just do it again. We'll all shut up. Why doesn't it happen? Oh, it always happens behind a closed door somewhere, though. It always happens in the third world country. It always ha it doesn't happen so everyone knows it's true. So, man, I, I just I just started to fall in love with the the study of God. Now, not like so I could believe in it, but like you, you ever kind of figure something out and go, "Oh my God!" So many people don't realize this. It's so interesting now, beyond what I thought it would be interesting, because now I realize what a tool this has been used as a, a controlling tool. And it's so powerful of a tool that it has the people 
who are enforcing it, they believe it. It's like, it's almost like a government that's set up that creates a, a system of people that kind of controls themselves. Can you imagine like, uh, you don't even have to control yourself. This, this system, psychologically, religion makes even the highest of people fall for it. And some people see outside of it, but they see it useful. And they yeah. say religion is good for people who are ignorant, that the ignorant need religion. In fact, some atheists say religion's good in some respects because of this reason to control the masses that are ignorant. Well, but I'd rather educate everybody personally. Just a quick side, and I want to get, it sounds like we're moving back to the end of your um, deconversion, and I, I, I want to get there, which is, I'm glad you're bringing it back to that. Just a side note of what you just said. One thought that I keep coming back to recently is, I wonder if C.S. Lewis knew some of the stuff that's come out in the last couple of decades since he had passed. But I don't know exactly when his, his uh, date of death was, but like there's so much that's come out. I've, I don't know the, all the dates of, you know, when the Nag Hammadi was more open to everybody studying it. Um, but all the research that's come out, all the mystery schools, I'm, I've, I keep thinking, I wonder if he would have gotten back out if he had, because he seems so studious and like, yeah. did he need it because of his background? Did he need Christianity to be true? Or was it truly he got into it because he studied it enough and, and obviously Tolkien and convincing him of the mythology that, that this was the real myth? Um, like if he had kind of dug a little bit deeper and had some other voices, you know, if he, if he had been, if, if part of the Inklings group was Richard Carrier, you know, and he, he'd had some chats with Carrier and Dr. Bob, would he have maybe rethought some of his positions and, and said, you know what? Hmm. I, I said at first it was myth. And then I said, no, it's, the, it's a myth, but it's, it's the one real myth. If he would have softened it later and said, maybe it might actually be just myth. <laughs> I don't know. That's, That's speculation, but. but. I think uh, Michael Heiser, Dr. Heiser, which I'd like to interview on my show as well at some point, even though he is a Christian, I don't, I don't judge for that, man. I, I just don't. Yeah. I understand why they think the way they do. I'm way I am for a reason, but I, he says the same thing. He has this like, uh, this is the true myth and yeah, there's other myths, but this one's true. And it's like, hmm, okay. When you say that, do you mean like, jesus himself is a myth or what what like what do you mean by myth you got to dig on these guys but i wouldn't um cognitive dissonance in in combination with emotion i think is what ultimately will prevent us it, i don't care how much evidence you can have sometimes um the emotion just does not allow there's vested interest in this religion that I feel there could be pride. You know, I I've been studying and I'm a wise person this long that there's no way I can't have the answer. Yeah. That could be a role. Um, but maybe as well as me not wanting to let go, it took me almost dying yeah. from addiction to be able to even investigate and let go of Christianity. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's a door that never, you can't open it. It's like, it's permanently sealed shut. This has to be right. It, it has, has to, be to be right. Yeah. And you can't be wrong about that. Even though, even along my journey, I would like, like I said with Mike Tyson earlier, make myself believe it. I would, I, my wife always went, how can you not doubt? And this is back when I was hardcore Christian. And I was like, doubting is wrong, honey. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, not to doubt, you know, like the Muslims, you already know to automatically make that not a doubt. You put yourself where it's not a thing to doubt. And if you do start doubting, Make sure you get out of it quick and come right back to the truth yeah. and get right back on the path. You know, and like it's so probably from the devil. It's probably satanic or evil or or a test. Because yeah. remember, it's a test. Just like monotheism, I'll give you another example with why things don't work out. Uh, if things don't work out in Israel's history, well, let's see. They got conquered by Assyria. They got conquered by Babylon, Greece, Rome. You know, and there's many other situations where they get defeated. This and that. Why? Oh, ask, a, ask an Israelite. Oh, they'll tell you. We didn't keep Torah the way we we're supposed to, or uh, we did something wrong, or God's testing us, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, God literally in the story of uh, J Jacob or Joseph going into Moses, he says, I'm going to I'm going to bring your people to Egypt, make them slaves, and then 430 years later, He's going to release them from slavery because he had the power. It's all like a God show type thing. And so the Jews, if you will, by the first century, which is Israelites, 
um, here, when they're saying these things, they can't deny that, well, the reason why these things are happening is because our God got beat. Their God can't get beat. He's the only true supreme God who created everything. He's the master. So it's all fault on their end as to why bad things happen to them. Not my God doesn't exist. We today would look at it and go, well, dude, you didn't have a strong army. Your infrastructure sucked, you know, whatever it might be. That's why you got conquered and defeated and Assyria did great. And then Babylon. And then, you know, we, they don't really look at things like that. They're looking at things like God is supposed to be the one who does it. Just like in the New Testament times or around the Dead Sea Scroll times, even a century or two prior to the New Testament, if you take the consensus uh, carbon dating of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they believed that the Romans were going to get defeated. They didn't have a massive army like Rome, but they believed their God and angels were going to come with them and fight and defeat the enemies, the uncircumcised enemies of Israel. You didn't need millions of people. You just needed your, your, your guys right here and God. God would come. Even those Old Testament stories, be still and know that I'm your God. Well, they were ready to be still. That's how convinced they were of their myth. So Wasn't there one story where one of the Old Testament people thought that they were alone and, and God or an angel said, Hey, look, and, and open their eyes. And there's like angels everywhere. Elisha, Elisha or Elisha. Yeah. Not Elijah. I don't believe, I think this came after it. He, he was the one who took the mantle from Elijah and he actually, uh, what is the request that you have? Elijah says, and he says, I want double the portion that you have. And sure enough, Elisha performed 16 miracles in his life where Elijah performed eight. So if you go through and count the miracles, he did double literally the portion that Elijah did, but yeah, the, there's a revelation or being revealed that there's angels all around the mountains with swords drawn, ready to fight, you know? So, yeah. What, um, so just going back to your story, cause I, you, you've kind of um, moved that way a couple of times in what you've been saying. So you're now, you've, you've gotten through the, some of the doubts you're, you're getting some information from both sides of the equation. Like what, what was it that kind of finished that nailed that coffin shut for you. Like, what was it that said, or or just, or it, maybe it was everything you already said, but it's what was the time like for you when you said, "I am officially done," mm -hmm. or however you would phrase. Like, what what was that like? Um, I would say that I'd been thinking it for a long time, but I, there was a fear of even saying it. Mm -hmm. And once I said it, then I knew. I had to, I had to openly say it. You know, I had to finally start to say the word in comfortable spaces. And then it was, it was like, you know, you're a little bit afraid to say that you don't believe because it's just been embedded and ingrained in your thinking. But once I vocalized it and started to say, you know, I am, this is what I think. This is, this is me. Um, it solidified it to where I realized now it, it, some people get it so solidified that they're like closed off from any possibility that something may exist. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not convinced at all though. I am an atheist. I, I'm just not closed off to say there aren't possible ways things can be, but there could be pink elephants dancing to a funny tune in the metaphysical realm right now that I know it's possible. Yeah. Uh, what are the likely, what, what's, what do you think? Uh, let me ask a Christian. What do you think about pink elephants dancing in the metaphysical realm? Do you think that's what's going on? Well, prove that it isn't. Okay, uh, so you want to prove to me God exists? You got to give me basis in reality, yeah. and uh, I don't find that to be enough for me. In fact, I think a lot of experiences we have, without talking about drugs, because that's a huge role in ancient history as to what a lot of experiences can come from. But we have chemicals already in our brain, chemicals enough to see what you would call a god. Uh, dimethyltryptamine is in the pineal gland and and when we have near-death experience situations occur you are experiencing if you've ever tripped on mushrooms or done any type of acid or anything like that and i have and i'm not if you're a christian you never have good for you i've done some stuff and i've seen some stuff and i've and it was real it was it was as real as real can get however it was all in my brain and i've seen demons I've seen strange, cannot describe type objects. Um, I've tripped 
balls. <laughs> and while doing that, I realized real quick that chemicals can easily explain why we see things or experience things. And they say a lot of that comes down to your culture. So if you're a Christian and you have a near death experience or the chemicals get released in your brain, you might see the light at the end of the tunnel or gates, pearly gates to a heavenly place. or so your loved ones in this bright lighted place that you think Jesus rules on the right hand of the throne. But if you're from another culture that had you know, elves in theirs. Uh, I've heard this from, uh, um, what is the guy's name? He's a big psychedelic guy, but he talks about how he always saw uh, elves when he would trip on dimethyltryptamine and acid or whatever else. And he would see elves in this realm and they would dance and they would sing. And, and uh, anyway, like he had a different magic experience. Jesus guy? No, no. Okay. I want to interview Magic Jesus though. I got uh, Rob, I think it's Robert. What's his last name? I can't remember, but I want to talk about the magician Jesus too, because we always talk about historical Jesus. What was he? Who was he? What did he do? But um, I'm going to, hopefully he'll do it with me because he says he's kind of burnt out with the magician magic Jesus. He wants to talk about Paul being crazy. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, if Paul was a nutcase, let's hear it. But yeah, I just think a lot of experiences that we have can be explained by chemicals. Yeah. And um, I tell this to my sister-in-law, she's a Christian. My mother is a Christian. Can I can I tell you a quick interesting Please. side note? Um, my mom has always she's she knows how to get to my heart, right? Just like my wife, um, and she always tells me, Derek, you know Jesus is real, and I'm like, I'm not going to argue with my mom, right? So I was like, Look, mom, I I believe what I believe, and the reason I believe I have good reason to believe the way I do. I don't go into all of it. I don't waste my time. I'm like, that's not my goal. I'm not a basher of believers, like. There are atheists out there that, well, how dumb, mom, you know? No, I'm not going to do that to mom. Mama's always right, you know, in a way. Uh, I honor and respect my mom. But she says, will you pray pray right now so that I feel better and just ask God to forgive you if you're wrong? And I'm like, absolutely, mom. And I'll do it. I said, dear God, if I'm wrong and you're truly there and you are right and that, that everything I'm doing is a mistake, I'm a human and I'm just trying to figure things out. So please have mercy on me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. And mom goes, thank you, son. And I'm like, no problem, mom. Now, mom, can I tell you a story? And she goes, yeah, sure. It's not one of those crazy stories. I'm like, yeah, it is, but it ain't. I want to tell you the story of, of Odysseus from the Odyssey. It's the Greek story. It's a story about a man who was a husband, a father, a king, a leader of his people. And he knew that he had to go to battle, just like our, our, your husband, Mike Lambert, my father. So I, I know what I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? So I get in the door and mom's listening and I tell her the story of Odysseus, how he goes to battle against Troy and how in the battle they lost many, many warriors, but he was trying to make it back home and he's captured by a, a, a goddess. And this goddess takes him to a faraway land where he can't get home and he misses his wife and his children. And uh, the story starts out with him in bed with his wife, by the way, before he goes to war, you know, almost like they make love. And he, he gets lost on this faraway journey in battle. And I tell mom, I'm like, he's trying to get home. He wishes he could come home. And then the goddess finally grants it. She realizes he's just tired and he miss He loves his wife too much. So she grants it, but under the condition that she makes him look like a beggar and an old man. So Odysseus comes back and he sees all these men at the house that are drinking his, his drinks, his wine and his food, and they're destroying the house. They're taking all their stuff. And he comes as this old beggar and his wife, Penelope, I believe it is, comes out and sees him. And one of the women that works for him, the, the maidens, uh, ends up washing his feet and taking care of him. I'm skipping stuff. But anyway, while she's washing his feet, she sees a scar on his foot from a boar's horn that went through the, there's a scar on his foot in the exact location where Odysseus as a child had a boar run through his foot. Mm -hmm. And she's the woman who had him suckle from her breast as a child. And so she sees it and her eyes were opened and she's shocked. And she says, my Lord, it's you. It's you, Odysseus. And he grabs her by the throat. The Greek version is pretty intense, you know, grabs her by the throat and says, woman, tell no one that I am here. Almost like it's not my time. It's they're going to find out they're going to kill. I'm not ready yet. Don't mm -hmm. tell anyone. So she knows that Odysseus is back, but he says, Shh. I said, Jesus says the same thing in the gospels, mama. 
I said, Jesus did the same exact thing as his hero from another story, but it gets deeper. And then I talk about the woman who washed Jesus's feet with the fragrance oil and the Pharisees like, if he knew what kind of woman this was. And he says, anywhere that my gospel is preached, let this story be told far and wide. The woman's name in the Odysseus story means far and wide. It's the exact Greek word yep. as used in the gospel. So I said, mom, I understand why you believe. I said, but there's a connection here that's being missed and it's not talked about enough. This is a story. Yeah, there might be some history there, but it's a wonderful story. Don't get me wrong. You take it literal, you start having problems. This is history. It's mythology. It's myst mythology is history, by the way, in case anyone wonders. It doesn't mean it's literal, literally true in the historical sense. It's a mythology that's history, and I think it's beautiful. I do. Yeah. When we take it literally, no. It was so, so are the hordes of our past when we've murdered and killed and done things horrible. I don't think that's okay, but I think the story is a beautiful story in many respects. You know, a hero type story. So does it hurt you to see family still stuck in this? Um, I wish they would have the freedom of being able to think like I do now with this, but yeah. the way I look at it is this, the, what hurts the most is that they think there's a place after, and they may be focused on that more than the place here. Mm -hmm. However, I think a lot of my family is more liberal in their, in their way they live their life, that it doesn't affect them as much as maybe some of my family, like my mom. My mom worries about where she's going to go and where we're all going to go when we die. But at the end of the day, since I know, and my research has led me to conclude there is no afterlife situation where you got to worry about things. Um, I don't have that concern. It's not like I have to worry about what you believe is going to hurt you at the end. Uh, what it does is it might affect you now. So I would like to liberate my family more in thinking of the freedoms. Like if you want to think there's a God and you have reason to think, man, this is just too much coincidence that we exist and you have to believe that there's something out there, go for it. But don't tell me that, you know, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe this and that. Okay. You know, let's draw some lines. So for me to answer your question, yes and no, you know, I'm torn. I'm torn between it. I'd love to see family finally come out and see this, but there's, it's, we're deeply in, seated into the religious faith that I don't see that happening, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and they, they believe in a literal hell that you're, you're literally going to burn if you don't turn. My mom does, yeah. My dad's, my dad is confusing. Sometimes he pulls up a Sam Harris article from Playboy, and then in the next breath he talks about, no, 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 the Pope didn't say that. And I'm like, okay, dad, <laughs> you know. But it's hard to get those conversations with him. He's a Green Beret with ADHD. So, uh, he, all right, hurry up. I got 30 seconds. Tell me. All right, cool. Got to go. Bye. Does, so. does anybody, has anybody shunned you? Just said, I, no. I'm so, whatever they would say. I'm, there's something about what you're saying. I just, I won't talk about this with you anymore. They don't know everything that I know. They haven't heard everything I say. They don't even know the depth at which I'm in this. They know that I don't believe like them, but they still like, like to make comments like God's still using you because I help a lot of drug addicts. I do good, bro. I do more good works now than I ever did as a Christian. And I'm not a Christian. Yeah. My, it's like almost like the remedy to my recovery and why I stay clean is that I left Christianity. Hmm. It's almost like that. Like I almost really do believe that, religion was a an addiction for me yeah. and i didn't know how to balance life it it did not give me the tools to know how to live properly in the world we live in it just didn't it things didn't it didn't match reality i couldn't connect the two yeah yeah it, it, yeah there's so much i could say about that but yeah it's it's, it's true it, getting back to reality is one of the awesome, most awesome side effects of escaping you're just like i am to go back to the matrix idea again, I'm using my eyes for the first time. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is. And it's, it's hard to describe it to people because it's, I had people describe it toward me as <clears throat> we're not sure how to respond, but it's kind of like if you, and I've never been on, on drugs or anything, but they're like, if, if you came to us and said, Hey, I'm so excited about this heroin that, you know, I'm on is, won't you be excited with me? They're like, of course, we're not going to be excited with you. You're into something bad. And it's mm -hmm. like, you, what a ridiculous analogy. Like, 
my mind is free. I just got off the heroin. You're the heroin, not me. Right. And right. it's like they can't get it, yeah. but it's like awesome. Dude, he's a star, man. You're the star. Did you hear him? What's your what's your name? Owen. Owen, how old are you? Five. Oh, wow. I got a seven-year-old. He would have been playing with you if we were near each other. He, Mr. Derek lives near the ocean. Did you know that? Yeah. Kind of near the beach. Oh, here we go. Can you hear him? <laughs> <coughs> Whoops. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> family, bro. I'm going to put you down a second. You make me have to grab a couple of mine now. Hold on. Let me yell at him. Kaden, Caleb, come here. Let you guys meet my boys. Come here. Come here. Get on this side of me. You can see my kids. Okay. Come here, Caleb. All right. Here. <clears throat> Hold this here. So here's here's <laughs> Caleb. And here's Caden. And Caden's seven years old. Say hi. And you would be Hi. playing with Owen, and he has a sister. Hey, this is Derek. <clears throat> Derek, this is Julie. Hey. Hey, here. Nice to meet you. This one, uh, that's it. Yeah. Can I say hi? Hi, Mr. Derek. Say hey, Kaden. Hey. Say hey, buddy. Hello. Hello. They've just been doing school. <laughs> What's he saying? Yeah, look at his so he's, he's got his mom's big old blue eyes this one right here <laughs> let it go you got it these are just two of them of course i've got another one but he's all in the living room so that's awesome uh, <clears throat> so it's three total yeah three boys oh, nice. Yeah, nice. we uh we are two boys two girls Woo. i couldn't have any girls huh the background. what Oh, yeah. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> All right, buddy. Uh, Go with your brother. I'll be there shortly, okay? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> what, um, what I wanted to ask, kind of to wrap up, is to ask, is it possible for us to do a few videos where I kind of pick um, some topics? I'd love to go through a couple, give you a heads up so you're not surprised. Yeah. You know, give you some time to think about how we uh, phrase it. But I, I think some of the things that... <clears throat> A lot of the interviews that I see going on, a lot of, a lot of the videos, like including the ones I've done so far, which isn't that many, but they kind of skim through. Whoops! Oh no, I got one more that wants to say hi. Come here. Okay. <laughs> you want to say hi? Come here. He is playing with the locks. Hey. <laughs> say hi. <laughs> <laughs> blue eyes. Look at them blue eyes. Yep, blue eyes. All right, go get a snack. <clears throat> what um, <clears throat> what I feel like happens with some of this is I know that I'm digging in. I've got you know tons of books right above me. I know you're digging in. You're obviously talking to the, the master himself all the time. Um, Dr. Bob, you're getting so much. We're getting information, but for someone that <clears throat> kind of was like, I don't quite know what you're talking about. I don't know what 153 means. Right. I don't know why you're talking about mystery cults. I don't even know what that is, <clears throat> but I, I know it's, I know that's not what Christianity is. So how is that relevant? And I think one of the coolest things would be is to, to take a couple topics and dive in and say, for, for someone that says I'm on the fence and I, I know there's more to dive into, but I, I don't even know where to start. I'm like, what's the starting point of all this? I would love to give them a kind of a primer and say, there is so much we could we could and you should start diving in to endless subjects but the goal of this for for now is simply to say where did this what is this book where did it come from and what's going on and i think if we could give people kind of enough information that they can kind of launch and say yeah i see what you're saying i see where this came from it could help people to get an understanding of just where to where to get the tools to start to think through it themselves. And I'd love to do that with you over the next few uh, weeks and months as time allows, just to kind of give people the tools. 
because there's, there's, you know, when you listen to a Dr. Carrier, to a Dr. Fitzgerald, even Dr. Bob, as, as, as um, easy as he is to, to listen to, you get the sense of like, wow, do I need to be a PhD to understand this stuff? Do I need to right. study for 10 years to know what this all means? And it's like, no, you really don't. But you're obviously, you know, a lot of your videos appropriately go very deep. You go into some of the deepest stuff and I love it because it's like, that's now we're getting to the meat. We're getting to, to real stuff. And I would love to give people a little bit of meat enough to say, if you're new to this, we're not going to overwhelm you. We're not going to just put, put this on blast. But we are going to give you enough that when you're done, if you listened, if you listened and you didn't just say, oh, this is garbage. I'm, or if you just came at it with a pure apologetic, like, I will listen only to debunk you. But if you say, I will actually, like you said, humble myself, I will listen. I will take some steps to study this stuff myself. I think it would put a lot of people on the path to deconversion. And if, if people, yeah. to me, I'm like, obviously some people are going to be like, you're trying to trick me. I'm scared of that. Obviously I want to do anything to stay away from falsehood. But if you're thinking of it from the perspective of a Christian of, all right, I know that what I know is real. It's right. There's no way that it can ultimately be falsified that all we're going to do is basically give you some stuff to say, Hey, here's, here's your apologetic um, to do list on a platter. Just, just tear apart the mystery cult stuff. Just tear apart the, the astro theology, tear it apart. And there's nothing left for us to stand on. But so you don't have to be afraid as an apologist or as a Christian, but if you're going to come openly and honestly to it and say, all right, I will listen and I will see if this really has any meat to it. I think a lot of people would, would, if they do come openly, they would say, you know what? I started this thinking, I'm just curious. I didn't think you had much to say. Actually, I think you have more to say than the Christians are doing. I think you're getting at the truth of the matter more than the apologists are. I think you're taking the weeds away and what you're leaving me with. I have to have it. I have to know what this means. I have to get to the core of this. And I, uh, I don't want anyone to feel any pressure in the, in the tone of any videos that I make, but I do want people to feel like th that it's going somewhere and that the destination is clearly deconversion. It is not to say, I'm just, I just like studying stuff and I just mm -hmm. like to talk about subjects. That's not where this is going. However, whatever path people take, the goal of this is to get people back to reality, which by by default is going to include deconversion and I'd, I'd love to give people uh, and I'll be up front with that I'm not going to hide it you know I'm not I'm not here to just chat about some Bible subjects I'm here to um, talk about what it means to be a Christian what it means to believe in the Bible what that really is is all about and I think once you kind of like said pull the curtain back am I from where I'm standing deconversion is absolutely inevitable um, yeah, it's just and that's I'd love to go to some of those depths with you and give people a primer so they can dive deeper. I definitely know that covering that subject in thorough, like thoroughly and going exhaustively will be important. You don't have to be a PhD to understand this stuff, but I run to PhDs and those who are scholars because they knew and know how to study first-hand sources, secondary sources, and delve into the material and are able to see things in their original languages and how they could be borrowed or used. Like in the book of Acts, um, the Dionysus or the Bacchae, Dionysus is being ripped off. Like even Dr. Price, who's hesitant to, to say plagiarism, he admits that verbatim um, the Bacchae is used in Acts, verbatim, which he says is plagiarism. So yes. he's like, they literally plagiarize Dionysus here in, in the Bacchae. What? So, hold on. What? And what are your Christians going to say? Here's what they're going to say. They're going to go, the Bacchae uh, uh, borrowed from Acts or some crap. They're going to try and act like Dionysus, the Bacchae is borrowing from Christianity and not vice versa. Well, you just, know what they'll say? They'll say the Bacchae did come first. Christianity did copy it. But you know who planted the Bacchae in history? Satan. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that, it just depends on which apologist, because some of yeah. the church fathers, it seems, argue that, or at least uh, they argue that the idea that Satan knew beforehand, so he planted these BS lies before. Uh, and then other sh- apologetics have said, no, no, they borrowed from Christianity. Like they're willing to go that far. The, uh, that's how some of these apologists will argue. But you got to ask questions like the eating of the flesh, drinking of the blood, right? Uh, where did this come from? Christianity absolutely did not get borrowed from on this aspect. We know that uh, Osiris, the cults of Osiris, they dated way older that you were partaking of the body and the blood of Osiris, which was cut into 14 pieces by his brother Set. So uh, Osiris was cut as a sacrifice, if you will, into 14 pieces by his brother Set. And of course, his wife Isis is looking, his sister wife, by the way, I believe it is, Isis was looking for his, his shaft, his uh, phallus, and she has to create one and magically births a child, uh, Horus, from this created shaft of Osiris. Bro, what the heck? You know, like, you know, there's just, how do you take this literally? Um, but they would have a sacrament and they did, it was uh, bread and, and uh, beer instead of wine. And but they, they had a Lord's Supper. They had a sacrament. They had a eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. You were to partake of the God and digest the God, if you will. And here you have Jesus doing this. Who borrowed from who? And why is this in there? Why did Paul cre- like believe this? And people who want to make this more Jewish do their damnedest to try and figure out a way to make it somehow Hebrew or original to some Judaic uh, understanding. Oh no, that's the Passover meal. Uh, That has nothing to do with a mystery cult, divine partaking of the gods scenario. Uh, I get why they're trying to do that. And I think the New Testament authors kind of are trying in a way to merge Judaism in with this mystery school, because what the hell is Hellenism other than syncretism that takes place in a time where cultures merge and collide. And there they are trying to do that. Christine Hayes, Dr. Christine Hayes does this. She, she takes you through and says, Paul stoic name a Jew that says the law is a bad thing. No, they love the law. I mean, Paul, David, King David praises the law, right? Here comes Paul and he makes this weird thing about the law. And here you have, I think stoicism. Paul is saying the letter of the law is no good. If you read about what Stoicism is, which your Bible will not teach you, you have to know what that is outside the Bible in order to get a grasp on why first century Jews who were Hellenistic would have that in mind. They saw the law, the written law, as not perfect. The perfect law was the divine law, the law of the source, the Hellenistic Platonic type of view of God that Plato also has, and and so does Philo. Mm -hmm. Philo kind of has this merge of Greek idea and jewish and say hey how do these marry let's make a marry paul believes to do the same thing according to what a lot of scholars suggest yeah it it is amazing that that's the kind of insight that i think it's it's from a fairness perspective it's not fair to deprive people of that basic thing <clears throat> that basic information yeah if they're really going to believe it <clears throat> they need to, to know where this came from and fine if you still want to believe it when you're done that's fine but don't sugarcoat, you know, as from the Christian perspective, don't sugarcoat it and then, you know, ex- expect people to not be surprised when they go off to secular college and discover some different parts of these things, maybe. And suddenly they're deconverted, like, why are you so shocked? They, You didn't tell them the whole story. You just didn't tell them. Anyway, it looks like... Uh, yeah. We're both being pulled into our uh, harassed. Harassed, you mean? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> give me snacks. Well, this has been awesome, man. This has been. I feel like we could go for a while, and I'm sure we will again soon. But this has been yes. great. It's a great intro. Yeah, and I'm, I, I want to say for anyone who does watch us, I'm far from an expert, and everything I'm saying is, uh, you know, up for grabs. Uh, I don't say this is the truth. I like that's the point of scholarship too, though. Scholarship is open to being wrong and open to these ideas. I wasn't really open to these ideas. Can you truly say you're being scholarly if you're not open to the possibility that these are the things that you need to look at? Guys, check out Yahweh. Look at look at why his name was not Yahweh prior to Abraham or prior to Moses. He was known as El Shaddai. I mean, and uh, you know now he's Yahweh. Like 
look at the the opposite side honestly not just trying to poke at it uh if you if you can find the hurdle of that emotion because that emotion is like my dad is right no matter what um you know try i guess i don't know how that's even possible i don't even see how it, it's almost like a miracle to come out of it man it's like a something has to open your eyes so yeah it's almost de depressing thinking about the fact that it is so hard for some people and then i, I you know people you just you're like i can't imagine so and so ever leaving and you're like well no. i was that person that was me yep. i couldn't imagine myself leaving uh now I'll, I'll tell you more about that on another video but yeah there's there's no way i would have left but here i am yeah hey tim keep doing this man i really do appreciate it and i do think i i agree with you that deconversion or if you will leaving that aspect uh of christianity is helpful if someone wants to remain a theist they think there's something that made this and that we exist there's nothing in my personal uh, uh, as an atheist who doesn't think that there's nothing wrong with that but if you're um really wondering why we have a hard-on so to speak against fundamentalist christianity or any type of Christianity that's not extremely liberal, you got to you got to realize we came from that, and how we realize coming out of it, it's like me talking about my drug experience with heroin. It was not good. There might have been moments where it was great, the high used to work, until I started to deteriorate and die, and, and things started killing me. So uh, that, to me personally, uh, it's dangerous. I do think that it's dangerous to have people believing in such stories to the degree they do it affects the way they live their life it affected me at least if you're a fundamentalist like this it divides humanity i know for a fact everyone who didn't believe in jesus the way i did at least to that core of him being the son of god and true they were all going to hell and they were wrong and so that's a pretty philosophy to have on humanity isn't it that very few are going to make it to heaven and most are going to go to hell yeah, exactly. It. And how can you say have a nice day to anyone? How can you bump into your neighbor and say, have a nice day, Joe? I know you're not a Christian. You're going to burn forever by our loving God, but have a nice day. How can you tell them have a nice day? It creates yeah. division, man. There's problems with it. So It does. And then they get elected and have their finger on the trigger of all of our atomic weapons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Political God warfare. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, this has been a great intro. I will um, definitely be Osmond for the next time. And thank you so much. Thanks to your boys for being patient for uh, time with daddy, but um, thank you. awesome intro and we'll uh, do it again soon. Thank you again. All right, brother.